morning, everybody. My name is Johanna Trieg, and I'm glad to bring to you this joint interview featuring Mario Centeno, governor of the Portuguese Central Bank, and Klaus Knot, head of the Dutch Central Bank and vice chair of the Financial Stability Board. Please don't forget to sign in your swap card app where you can submit questions. You can also tweet about the session using the hashtag PoliticoFS. A very warm welcome to the two of you governors and thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us today. Um, before we start, could I please ask you just to wave at me in case you would like to add something. Um, now, we've all been waiting for an end of the pandemic and an economic recovery to kick in. And we're hoping that you could help us shed some light on when things might finally start to look up. Um, so I would like to address my first question to you, Governor Centeno. Um, the European Central Bank in December projected a growth of 3.9% for the Eurozone this year. Do you see a significant risk that the disappointingly slow rollout of the vaccination campaigns across Europe could force the ECB to downgrade its growth projections? Good morning and many thanks, um, Joanna. I just want uh, to remind you uh, and the audience that um, we governors are uh, just uh, entering our quiet period in which governors avoid making comments that could influence expectations about monetary policy decisions uh, in the seven days before a scheduled meeting on these issues. So this will uh, likely impact a little bit, but not too much uh, in, in, in this conversation. Well, you know, the, the economic shock that we are um, suffering is exogenous. It is common and it is quite global. No geography uh, has been spared. Actually, the last figures uh, available points to a world GDP decrease around 4% in 2020. But the good news uh, are also there. International trade has already almost recovered to the pre-pandemic levels. And these, uh, of course, will shape uh, the recovery and is shaping the recovery. There's a, something that I always like to, to, to highlight is that uh, our economic systems reacted immediately to this absolutely unprecedented lockdown that uh, we imposed uh, in our economies. Well, while on the one hand, this was pretty amazing uh, because um, we uh, observed the economy uh, reacting, but uh, the real extent uh, of the crisis is still difficult to, access, uh, to assess. And this is... Um, uh, on, on, on the back uh, of uh, a fact that I also would like to, to stress, which is that the macroeconomic data has so far generally surprised everybody uh, on the upside. The current confinement, which is in place in many countries, is putting additional pressure into uh, already stressed firms. And this is my main concern. And I go now to, to, to your question. Uh, how long will our firms stand a partially closed economy for uh, a period that is not any longer absolutely temporary for some of them. We should make no mistake, the economic uh, and financial positions of the non-financial sector is damaged and that will impact the recovery all over the world. The exact magnitude is, uh, as I said, still hard to assess uh, as we are not yet out of the woods. Uncertainty will only vanish as indeed as the vaccination makes progress. I don't think uh, we have a particular problem with that uh, in Europe, but uh, we must be uh, aware that this is really uh, hurting uh, the, the recovery process, every, all, all this uh, environment. If we go back uh, one year ago, the first shock wave was even across sectors. But this is not true anymore. Across all our economies, the recovery is indeed right now quite uneven across sectors. There is nothing structural about it, but it is indeed related uh, with the nature of the pandemics. Mm -hmm. 
that's why uh, the, the ECB uh, has uh, been stressing uh, that we must ensure adequate financial conditions in all sectors. And this part of the sentence in all sectors is quite, uh, is quite important. Let me add a little bit of optimistic though. We, we uh, uh, have surprising good news in the resilience of investment and the increase in savings. And I think those two components uh, will be an important factor for the recovery. Hmm. A major success so far, and, and this will also shape the recovery and the possible revision of, of the numbers uh, ahead of us, is that we were able to avoid the crisis uh, to morph into a financial crisis. This was a great success. And I think this was due to a great extent to the effectiveness uh, of the policy response. It has been swift, large, and comprehensive. In Europe, for the first time, and we must be proud of that, we joined the efforts of the fiscal and monetary policies. The fiscal effort being designed both at the national and the union level. And this was also a novelty uh, this, time, this time around. At mm -hmm. the central level, uh, I want to stress the, the role uh, of um, the European Commission that uh, was mandated to get market financing uh, of a huge amount uh, of, of euros, 750 billion euros. It will be one of the largest triple A issuer in euros um, uh, in the future, offering global investors uh, a new highly rated asset in euros. And this will stay with us for a long period of time, framing the financial markets in Europe for decades to come. This was indeed an integration leap. And I am sure that this will have an impact in terms of confidence in the near future uh, in, uh, yeah. in Europe and will help us uh, going forward. Thank you very much, Governor Centeno. You've touched on a lot of issues already. Um, could I just follow up perhaps for one thing you mentioned is um, that it's important that we have accommodative financing conditions for all sectors in the economy. Now, um, looking at the growth outlook, um, Governor Kano, uh, are you concerned? Because we've had recently this uh, rise in long-term yields. Do you think that that has significantly impacted borrowing costs? Do you think that that is one of the real risks to the economic recovery at the moment? Well, I would turn it around. I mean, and the picture that emerges uh, from, I think, the quite comprehensive uh, uh, presentation that has just been given by, by Mario is one that I would call uh, cautious optimism. So there is reason uh, to be optimistic about the second half of the year uh, when the lockdowns will be lifted. And, uh, and we're hopeful that we would then see a similar uh, development that we have already seen in the third quarter of last year when also uh, lockdowns were lifted and the economy uh, rebounded quite strongly, even uh, more strongly than we had anticipated at that, uh, at that time. Um, but cautious optimism, of course, because there are still these uncertainties around uh, the vaccination process and the uncertainties about corporate uh, credit worthiness. Uh, once we come out of this crisis, once this veil of uncertainty is being lifted, what then is the true state of resilience of the corporate sector and sort of what are the issues that that will bring? Um, so I think what the market is actually doing is pricing that optimism. So the question at this point is not so much, the question that you ask is the question that we have to address next week. And like Mario, I'm in the same silent period that he is. So I'll be careful to make observations about that question. But I think the starting point should be that the rise in rate reflects better growth prospects and better, uh, higher inflation expectations. And that in and of itself is a positive story. Mm -hmm. Now, um, if you, I understand you can't address the very near-term policy issues given the quiet period, um, but Governor Santeno mentioned this issue where um, there's a divergence in the recovery, um, which runs through the economies. Um, yeah. Could you perhaps 
explain to us what policy challenges this might pose for the European Central Bank? Well, the dichotomy, I think, is if you look at uh, the, the manufacturing industry uh, part of the economy, it's doing very well. It's doing extremely well. I mean, PMIs are at very, very high levels. Uh, international trade has more or less resumed. Uh, if you look at the indicator for international trade that our uh, central planning bureau in the Netherlands always collects, it is back at levels uh, pre-corona. Uh, so the weakness is entirely located in the services sector. Um, and there's really not much else that I think that policy can do about that than what policy is currently doing, trying to give as much income uh, support to the uh, affected services providers, uh, uh, the restaurants, the shops, uh, etc. And uh, then we have to overcome uh, the pandemic by, uh, by this vaccination uh, program, on which, by the way, I entirely agree with, uh, with Mario. I think there has been a little bit too much pessimism about this uh, program. Um, but I think the outlook is still uh, for uh, huge parts of our population. Well, if I can give you an example, uh, the health minister in the Netherlands announced uh, yesterday that everyone uh, will have had its first jab by the first week of July. So that is, I think, uh, uh, that's, a, that's a decent effort and that gives uh, still some, some reasons, uh, reasons for optimism. Um, and then once these lockdown restrictions get lifted, then of course the services sector can resume its activity quite quickly. Uh, it's not a capital intense sector. There hasn't been much destruction of, let's say, productive uh, uh, capacity. Uh, there is this abundance of forced savings on, on all of our bank accounts uh, that could be unleashed uh, by then. So policy, I think, should do, continue to do what it does until huh, as long as these uh, lockdown restrictions are in place. And then it should very, very gradually retreat, but of course, try to avoid a, a sudden cliff effect, because that's one of the next challenges. Mm. So, Governor Centeno, do you so do you would you agree then that this is a tough spot for the services industry, but it would not necessarily have a lasting impact on eurozone economies, in the sense yes, that it would uh, actually change the structure. Well, I think I think um, the uh, when I mentioned that it it is amazing the the way uh, our economic system evolved is also because I was thinking uh, on its uh, ability to, to adapt uh, over time to the different lockdowns. Remember that uh, when all these uh, began one year ago, the first um, big uh, impact in our economies was a total disruption of supply chains. Uh, and these impacted quite heavily uh, on the manufacturing sector as well. But these evolved quite rapidly. Uh, uh, over the course uh, of the, the next uh, few months, uh, over the summer and, 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 and autumn. And, and uh, this is already, uh, to, the, to a great extent, fixed. The services sector, on the contrary, is really uh, being um, hit uh, more, more severely and, and it, it, it continues to, to, to be so. While the monetary response uh, allowed for favorable financial conditions across sectors, and I think this is the case, the fiscal policy uh, was able and must continue to be able to target to target the most vulnerable sectors. I totally agree with um, with Governor Class uh, on, on this. Uh, so this joint effort must continue uh, while. Uh, the impact uh, of the pandemic is still with us mm. uh, until we don't get to the pre-crisis uh, levels uh, of outcome. Mm. Now, Governor Knut, I would like to address the next question to you, also because of your role in the Financial Stability Board. Um, so the longer the crisis lasts, um, and, and Governor Centeno just addressed that as well, um, the bigger the bigger the the higher the number of companies that are likely to go bust um how well do you think the financial sector is prepared for a potential flood of non-performing loans um do you think there's a risk that this health crisis might morph into the next banking crisis well i uh on the latter question uh, my answer would be uh, no 
Um, but of course, uh, the, you, you can, that can never be an unconditional no. But my starting point would be uh, that I would like to echo what Commissioner McGuinness said in the previous uh, session, that one big difference with the previous crisis has actually banking resilience. So whereas 10, 15 years ago, there were these financial amplification effects uh, that worked through the financial system with the speed of light, and we had sort of one institution arriving into trouble after the other one, et cetera. All these factors, all these financial amplification factors have not, uh, have not resurfaced in this crisis. And I think this is the consequence of the financial reform agenda that we set out after the global financial crisis, much stronger bank capital, rigorous stress testing, it actually works. So the banking sector is in much better shape. And I think this is what you are currently seeing. That also means that the banking sector has been better placed to build defenses against this inevitable rise in NPLs uh, that will, uh, will, will happen uh, in, in, in the coming months and, and, and coming quarters. Of course, the first line of defense is provisioning. After the previous uh, crisis, provisioning rules uh, were made to be much more forward-looking, and therefore provisions have been taken, have been taken quite aggressively uh, last year, and that, has for, that form now forms a first line of defense. A second line of defense is the amount of buffers that are available in the banking sector. We released some of the uh, previous uh, supervisory buffers in order to make even more free buffer space available. Well, uh, if you look at core equity tier one ratios, they're still uh, fairly high at this moment. And there are significant buffers in these core equity tier one ratios available as a sort of second shock absorber. Now, will it be enough? Probably yes. If it wasn't enough, there would probably be more anxiety already in the markets about, uh, about banking resilience. Because again, we saw 10, 15 years ago that if there is this type of anxiety, it, it transmits through the financial system with the speed of light. But I think analysts are right in, uh, in observing uh, that banking sector resilience is much better and that we can be fairly confident that we won't see the return of these financial amplification mechanisms that we saw uh, in the aftermath of the previous crisis. So is that right then that you also don't really fear because the recovery or, or the economy ha has been so resilient in part because there has been such massive amount of fiscal spending. Um, so, you know, this sort of uh, feedback loop between high debt um, for governments and banks. Um, so you don't really see a risk of that coming back either. And perhaps um, do you also think that the, the, the current response where fiscal authorities and the monetary policy authority really worked hand in hand, has dispelled financial market fears about European solidarity once and for all? Well, I mean, that's a lot, a lot of questions that you're Sorry. proposing. But it is inevitably true that sort of once fiscal support eh, will have to gradually we, be withdrawn, only then will we know the true sort of state of the corporate sector. And yes, there will be corporate defaults. There will have to be corporate restructuring, debt, corporate debt restructuring that will have to be, take place. And inevitably that implies that losses will have to be accepted. Uh, losses will have to be accepted on guarantees and banks will also incur uh, losses on, uh, on these loans. But it's, uh, uh, the question is, of course, how well are they prepared to, uh, to absorb these losses? And I think that they are relatively well prepared. And I think the joint policy effort of monetary policymakers, of fiscal policymakers, but also of prudential regulators, has indeed uh, been successful in, uh, in paving, uh, paving the ground uh, for this. Obviously, I don't have a crystal ball, mm -hmm. and there is a certain degree of uncertainty uh, around this process. But I am confident uh, that the banking sector is mm -hmm. in as good a place as it could possibly be, uh, given the severity yeah. of, uh, of the shock. Your second question relates to European integration and the signal that has been given by the recovery fund, etc. Yes, I also think that that is a very potent signal. And that's a signal that has been picked up quite well on financial markets. And that has, for instance, eased our lives also in trying to reduce uh, mm -hmm. sovereign bond spreads. 
So the effectiveness of the, the PEPP, which I think is undisputed in uh, encountering uh, this, this destructive rise in spreads that we briefly saw in March 2022, this effectiveness has been greatly enhanced by the recovery fund and the activity of our, our finance ministers and our leaders because it has convinced once more financial markets uh, about the integrity of the euro and the integrity of uh, yeah. European integration. Okay, now, unfortunately, we're very close to our end already. Um, and I would like to quickly ask you one, uh, address one last issue. And that is um, the role the, the ECB might be able to play in supporting Europe's green recovery. Um, now, as I said, we only have very few time, very little time left. So perhaps, um, Governor Centeno, you might want to start. Do you think that the ECB can actually use its massive balance sheet to help finance? The, the green recovery, i.e. adjust its quantitative easing program to um, finance more green projects? Or is that something for governments? Well, I can, I can, I can be, be, be brief and um, <laughs> actually uh, positive in, in, that, uh, in that question. Uh, the, the, the packing order of measures is very clear, and of course, for a, a, a global externality, we all know from the economics point of view what, what we should do. And so uh, governments uh, have the primary action uh, here, but uh, uh, we cannot uh, dismiss uh, the quite um, disturbing uh, impact uh, uh, on, in risk, on risks and, and on the economy. Uh, that this sort of uh, climate um, uh, cha change and challenge uh, posed to monetary policy. Uh, and so uh, we should, uh, from our part, uh, be ready uh, to, to, to help and to participate uh, in this uh, global uh, uh, dimension uh, of, of, this, uh, of this challenge. And, and I think uh, this is... Uh, quite uh, an important issue for, for central banks as well. Mm -hmm. Governor Knod? Yeah, I, th I think climate change clearly affects uh, the ECB's policy in many domains. It will lead to adverse demand and supply shocks that will change our possibly change our inflation outlook, i.e. it will affect our primary mandate. It is part of our secondary mandate eh, to support EU policies uh, and, and, of course, the governments need to be in the lead. And I want to stress here eh, that nothing is more effective than carbon pricing. That should be first and foremost uh, policy response. But where uh, the ECB can help support these policies, it should absolutely do so. We have to protect also the financial risks of our own balance sheet. That financial risk profile is going to change because of climate risk. So there we have to update our activities and I'm a strong believer also in climate risk disclosures. And there, I think also central banks can play a role by asking disclosures from the counterparts with which uh, we conduct our monetary policy operation. So in short, these are already four domains where I think uh, it's perfectly legitimate for the central bank to be active. Thank you very much uh, to the two of you. Um, so I guess you're leaving us with a sense of optimism or let's say cautious optimism. Um, for the economic outlook. Um, and we're looking forward to um, the recovery being greener with the support of the ECB. Um, now, thank you very much for uh, joining this session. Our next session will be the spotlight discussion on lessons learned by the financial uh, sector and mm -hmm. what it can do to support the economic recovery. The session will start at 9.45 and will be hosted by my colleague, Matej Roska. In the meantime, you can explore the Summits app and book meetings with your peers.